Well, good morning. Merry Christmas. Hope you had a great holiday. Uh, good job, Kevin and singers. It's always, always great to be able to worship with you as you lead. Uh, I really appreciate Mike being here last week and filling in uh, to preach uh, on the topic of Prince of Peace. He did an excellent job uh, and is a gifted speaker. He'll be back on January the 17th. We'll launch our new series in two weeks, but he's going to come back in and, and join on that series as well. But I appreciate him uh, and his, his ability to preach. This morning, we're going to finish up the four names of God that are prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9, the subject of our series, What a Wonderful Name. I sure hope it's been a blessing to you. Uh, it's been a blessing to me. But we're going to finish up the fourth name, and then next week, we're going to talk about all of those, the sum total of those, with our Emmanuel, God with us. But today, we're going to uh, wrap up the four names mentioned in that Isaiah 9 passage. So I need to beg your indulgence one more time to give you a little bit of background uh, because that is such an important part of, of this story to understand a little bit of the context. But if you think about all the things that are going on when Isaiah wrote that passage, there was once a united kingdom under David and Solomon which had now been split into two. And so if you think about the palm of your hand, all your fingers, the north part, that's uh, going to be the north. There was Israel, and to the south you have Judah. Uh, and, is, and Isaiah is ministering and prophesying uh, in Jerusalem, which is located in Judah. So Judah's the palm, and Israel is up here in your fingers. Um, but Judah and Israel had both really been uh, just through it with really horrible kings, uh, really bad kings. And Judah was a little bit better, but not by much. They were really plagued by, by just having bad kings. Ahaz was, excuse me, was the king that was mentioned in Isaiah 9, as we were, have been studying and as I have mentioned before. Uh, but during that time, Ahaz was just not a very good king. And the other kings surrounding him decided that they wanted to come in and, and teach him a lesson, uh, that they wanted to... Uh, just, just show him what it, was, what it was about, what true power was like, what it was like to overturn a kingdom. Uh, you can read through First and Second Kings and see just how bad things really were. Uh, but Ahaz is, is going to be attacked by the two kings, the kings of Israel and the kings of Aram. Uh, and they're going to teach him a lesson uh, with an additional threat coming from the larger, more powerful Assyrian army that's been sweeping through the nation. And so amidst all of this turmoil, amidst all of this tension, amidst all of this pressure and stress and the threats of war and the threats of people being killed and being taken away from their family and their friends and sent off to other countries to be enslaved, God sends Isaiah to let Ahaz know that everything is going to be okay. God comes in and has, has uh, Isaiah send this message to Ahaz that everything's going to be fine. Uh, that, that it's going to be okay, that we will overthrow those armies, that there is no threat greater than my power. And I will be able to overthrow those kingdoms. You rest secure in me. And Ahaz, as we know, as we've talked about over the past few weeks, completely rejects God, completely rejects his provision, completely rejects his, his uh, provision and his protection. And instead, he runs to the larger Assyrian army, to the king, uh, tiglath Pileser. So look with me just real briefly in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 17, as we begin to wrap up this little background. But in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Ahaz sent messengers to say to tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, I am your servant and vassal. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Aram, and the king of Israel who are attacking me. So Ahaz here is, is rejecting God's protection. He's rejecting his security. And he's instead throwing himself at the feet of tiglath Pileser. I want you to be my father is basically what he is saying. Come in and protect me. Come in and take care of me. Come in and take care of my people. And it doesn't work out very well for Ahaz and for Judah. You can read on about that in Second Kings. I'm just going to leave it there and move on. So, so Isaiah is here in this turmoil and in this horrible time with, with bad kings and the threat of, of a king turning them over to giving them into another king. And Isaiah is coming in and bursting through that darkness to assure them that 
Assyria is not going to be their king, that they are not going to be, that he is not going to be their father, or these bad kings, that's not going to be your father. There is a father coming. There is an eternal father that's coming, that he's going to come as a child, he's going to reign forever, he's going to stand outside of time, he's going to be an everlasting father. And that's where we are today. The focus of our lesson is on the everlasting father. So this term, everlasting father, can also be, tr be translated as father of eternity. And it can be confusing when you're talking about a baby because that doesn't really make sense. Now why does that make sense when we talk about the nature of Jesus, this, this child king that's going to be born? It makes perfect sense when you look through all the scriptures and, and, and the Bible because the New Testament actually teaches us that idea that Jesus just didn't show up in Bethlehem, that he lived outside of time, that he just took on human form, the incarnation. He existed before Bethlehem. He'll exist after Bethlehem. He is eternal. He is going to last forever. He just took on flesh and blood when he became a baby, that incarnation that we talked about a few weeks ago. So think about John. Whenever we, two weeks before I was preaching two weeks ago, remember what John said in John chapter 1. He says, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then you skip down to verse 14 of John chapter 1, and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten God, full of grace. So that's what John is saying about this eternal Father in John chapter 1. Other places in the New Testament, like, like the book of Colossians, when Paul wrote to the church in Colossae in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, he says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Jesus all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus is the father of eternity. He is the everlasting father. We can see it said in a different way in the book of Revelation, which was our scripture reading this morning. Remember when John is writing, when he sees Jesus, exactly what happens in John chapter 1, verse 17. John says, When I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me. And here's what he said. Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Why? Because I am the father of eternity. I am the alpha and the omega. I am without beginning and without end. I am outside of time. This is the nature of who Jesus is. So this everlasting father who was coming to be born among us reveals the father to us. And that's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is in fact saying so much in, in John chapter 10 verse 38. He says, if I do them, the works of my Father, verse 37, if I do them, even though you don't believe me, believe the works, believe what I do, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And he goes on to say in John 14, 9, he says, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me. The New Testament is full of confirmation that Jesus is the eternal Father. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. The Son, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He reminds us very specifically that he has come to reveal the, the God, his Father, to the world. That Jesus is God in human form, coming to reveal the fullness of the nature of God to the world around him. And that's why we see this title given to this child king, prophesying that he's going to be an everlasting father, 
we can see that this king is going to reveal the forever fatherly heart of God. He reveals to us the forever fatherly heart of God. And that's good news. It was good news then, and it's good news to us today. And I feel like that there are times whenever we, we see this world getting darker and darker, we're, we're mindful of the citizens of Nashville and that horrible bombing that happened on Christmas Day. The world just seems to get darker and darker. But no matter how dark the world gets, no matter what happens throughout the ages, God will burst through that darkness and remind us of who our Father is and who our Father is not. We have an everlasting Father. He's not in or of this world, but He is not bound by the tragedies of this world, but He is outside of time and tragedy. He's everlasting. This was a hard sermon for me to write because I realized that whenever I bring up the idea of, of fathers, that it's not exactly an easy word for some of us to hear. It's not easy for us to hear because some of us didn't have great fathers. For some, their dads are still, are still with them and they have been great. And you've got a great relationship, great memories, a great role model. And that's given you a lot of comfort and helped you be the father that you want to be. For others watching, you don't have a father. Some of you lost fathers at young ages, and you know what that's like, and they've been gone for quite some time. Some of you lost fathers more recently, and no matter how long it, it is between that time of his passing and now, the pain of the holidays is still there, and it still brings up all of those thoughts and all of those memories. Whether you lost them a long time ago or just recently, it's still hard. Some of you know your father, but, but he wasn't around because he just checked out and he didn't stick around with your family. And you can remember and you're haunted by the memory of looking out the window, waiting and wondering when he was ever going to come back. Some of you have a father that actually was around, but just not with you emotionally. He was there, but no real connection. He showed up, but no real connection. Some of you had a father that, that abused you physically, mentally, emotionally. The abuse is still the same. Some of you had a father that, that made you feel like you weren't good enough. And all you wanted to do was hear your father say, I love you. I'm proud of you. But you never could quite measure up. And you never heard those words said. We all have a hole in our heart. For a father, and that hole gets filled one way or the other. And some of us have tracked down abusive relationships, we've tracked down addictions to try to fill that void. But fatherlessness is a true epidemic in our society. And however your father falls into this category, these things mentioned above, it just it shapes you. It shapes how you view your heavenly father. It's the lens through which you see your heavenly father. And as hard as it was to preach this and obey the Holy Spirit, I know it's probably more painful for some of you. But it's, a good, it's, it's good. It's good that I've gone through this because I didn't have a perfect relationship with my dad. It's getting better. He's watching today, and I, I love my dad, and I know he loves me. But for some of us, it's hard. It's hard because we don't have a dad that measures up. And we want our Heavenly Father to be more, but He is more. Your Heavenly Father is so much more. And there's good news today that I want to share with you and give you hope. In the midst of this carnage, this relational carnage, the fatherlessness that's shaping our nation, it's horrible. Uh, any of the research that you do on fatherlessness in our society will, will just bring you to your knees. But that's not the case because we have an everlasting Father and we have to change the way we view our Heavenly Father. We've got a great word spoken by, by Isaiah. He says, we have an everlasting Father. And I pray this morning that the Spirit of the Lord will work on your heart. I pray that the Spirit of the Lord will change your heart and will change your view so that you're not measuring your Heavenly Father against your dad, but you're measuring your Heavenly Father against himself, against the truth 
and the love that He is for you. Because what you're holding against the Lord because of your earthly father has failed you isn't the way that you need to measure your heavenly father. Because let me tell you, God's greatest creation, His greatest thing that He ever did is not the creation of the universe or the creation of seasons or plants or this world. That's not His greatest, greatest creation. His greatest creation, His plan to come after you, that's what is the greatest thing about God. It's His plan. Launched before creation to come for you. To come for me. Behind His coming for us is the very same power that created the universe. Behind his love for coming for me is the very same power that holds this universe in his hand. And the wonders of this world. Heaven and earth know no greater passion. No greater passion than God's personal passion for you. His personal passion for me and your relationship with him. He's your everlasting father. Earthly father or not, good father or not, your father with an eternal heart for you loves you, and he came for you. And it's so good that we have an everlasting father because he pardons us. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom Everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what we suffered. Both the one who makes, the pe makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Let's go on in verse 12. I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises... Again, Jesus says, I will put my trust in him. And again, Jesus says, here am I and the children God has given me. Highlight that on your phone. Underline that in your Bible. Here am I and the children that God has given me. Do you know that that fatherly declaration, that that proclamation through all the ages is a direct quote of Isaiah chapter 8? Verse 18, Hebrews 2, 14 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. While we're lost, while we're in that sinful relationship, while we have let the world take hold of us and we're shackled to sin, and the devil himself is in your ear whispering, I am your father. Your addiction is your father. All these things, underline, underscore, fill in the blank. They are your father. In light of all of that darkness, Jesus bursts forth into our lives, into our mess, into our sin and our trouble. And he dies our death. He dies in our place. He satisfies the justice of God on our behalf. His wrath against sin, his command for an atonement, Jesus takes that on for himself, for us. He takes our stuff, my mess, and he dies in my place, rising from the dead, conquering my sin, conquering the grave, conquering death, conquering the devil so that we can put our faith in him. And when we're buried in baptism and we're rescued, we're transformed, we're changed, and Jesus can say, all the children that you have given me, I have them right here. They're mine. That's the heart of an everlasting father who pardons us. 
But he not only pardons us, he provides for us. You see, your everlasting father is never going to run out of resources. He's never going to run out of provisions for you because he's everlasting. His supply chain will never end. He's made it all. He has it all. He's holding it all. And it's all here for you. He will provide everything we need in this life and in the life to come. He's our everlasting Father. Listen to what Peter said about our inheritance. Turn with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade. Everything we ever will have need of, He will provide in this life and in the life to come. Why? Because He is the everlasting Father who provides for us, who pardons us, and He also protects us. If you look at what Peter was saying in the verse I just read, and you keep moving down one more verse, he goes on to say in verse 4, the inheritance that will never spoil or perish or fade, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You're shielded. You're protected by God's power. The king of the universe, the king who formed everything, the king that was made, everything that was made was by him and for him and through him. He holds everything together This is the king who's holding you. What does that feel like? It feels like protection beyond anything we could ever in our lives imagine. You see, the beautiful thing about him being an everlasting father is that he's never going to leave us. He's never going to abandon us. He's never going to say, you've done it this time and walk away. He's always going to be there for us and he's always going to be coming for us. He's everlasting. He's our Father. And we're, we're seeing the forever fatherly heart of God in Jesus who will never leave us. He is the everlasting Father, the one who is over an indestructible kingdom, who is sitting on an eternal throne, who is going to live an indestructible life. We can always know that no matter what happens in the world, no matter what things come our way, the world that we're living in, we don't have to look to empires or presidents or provisions or governments to sustain us because we know, even though we want them to rule with with justice and righteousness, we know that that is not where our sustenance come from because we are sustained by an everlasting Father who provides for us. So not only does this everlasting Father provide for us, but He pardons us, He protects us, and lastly, He praises us. Now, I don't mean in the sense of of worship. I mean that in a sense that, that he says the words that you're longing to hear. He says the things that's going to fill your heart, that hole in your heart. Do you know how powerful it is for a father to say to a child, a son or a daughter, the words that will mean everything to them, that will change their future? There's something inside of us that resonates with the words of a father. They're telling us that they love us, that they're proud of us, that they, that they want us, all those things. And you can't imagine what that means, particularly if you've never had them. But they're still inside of you right now. As I speak, you're thinking, I don't have that. I ne- I've never known what that feels like. But you do. You have an everlasting father who is speaking into you through his word every day. And don't believe the lies that you have no father because you have an everlasting father who is here and he's never going to leave you. Listen to what the everlasting father says. This is what the everlasting father is saying to you. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17. This is what the Lord says. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves... He will take great delight in you. In His love, He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you 
with singing. I love you. I always have. I want you. I always will. Those are the words of an everlasting father who loves you, who came for you. Write that down. Memorize that. Read that verse to yourself in the mirror and believe it. Know that your eternal heavenly father comes for you, loves you, will never leave you, protects you, provides for you, and pardons you. In closing, I ran across a document that, that just really threw me for a loop. I've never seen it before. And it's called A Father's Love Letter. It's a letter from God to us. I don't know who the author is, but it's, com it's written completely from Scripture. And so in closing this morning, I want to read that to you. This is uh, going to be provided for you. We have the PDF on our website. You can download that or you can connect with us through our QR code or just reach out to me personally and I'll, I'll give you a copy uh, to make that available. But for those of us who've, who've been transformed, for those of us who know what it's like to put on the Lord in baptism, we've been changed by the gospel. We know what it's like to be forgiven and we want you to know what it's like if you've never known that. We want to be your church family. We want you to have a relationship with this eternal Father. The gospel will change you. You cannot come in contact with it and not be changed. He will always be proud of you. Your everlasting Father will always be proud of you. You won't do everything right, but He will love you no matter what with an everlasting love that will never change. He wants you because He loves you. Because he reached out and found you. He came for you. And he took your sin to the cross. And he died for you. And he adopted you. And he's proud to call you his brother. He's proud to call you his son. Let that sink in and soak into your heart. Every time that you see Jesus or hear that name. You see the child king. Be reminded that he is revealing to all of us. The forever fatherly heart of God. And that's why his name will be called Everlasting Father. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I'm familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being, for you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake. For all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I've been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I'm not distant and angry, but I am the complete expression of love. And it's my desire to lavish my love on you simply because you're my child. And I'm your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could. For I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand. For I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope. Because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sands on the seashore. And I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you. For you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul. And I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine, for I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are brokenhearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I will take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father. And I love you even as I love my son Jesus. For in Jesus my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you. 
and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might again gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son, you've received me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home, and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father, and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I'm waiting for you. Love, your dad, almighty God.